two decorated Air National Guard veterans, with thousands of flight hours between them, enter the clouds over Ohio on what should have been just another routine approach. Minutes later, their aircraft is shredded across a forest floor. How on earth could two such experienced aviators lose control? Here's the twist. It wasn't a mechanical failure. The real story lies in something far more hidden. Medications, physiology, and the invisible traps of night IFR flying. Let's dig into the hidden killers that made this tragedy possible. Let's start with who these men really were, because that changes everything about how we view this accident. In the left seat was Shane Allen Halbrook, 59 years old, from Avon, Indiana. Not just any pilot, he was a former Indiana Air National Guard colonel. On paper, he had a commercial pilot certificate with an instrument rating, a little over 1,100 total hours, and more than 600 hours in this specific airplane type. That's not weekend warrior flying, that's serious, committed proficiency. Beside him sat Michael D. Wright, 51, of Casey, Illinois. Also ex-Air Guard, but this guy had an even deeper resume. An airline transport pilot certificate, ratings in multi-engine airplanes and helicopters, and about 6,500 hours logged. That's airline level experience, plus rotorcraft versatility. To put it bluntly, you don't get much more qualified in general aviation cockpits. So these weren't hobbyists who didn't know what they were doing. These were seasoned, respected airmen. And on February 22, 2022, they climbed into a Piper PA 32-2-60, filed IFR from Effingham, Illinois, to Findlay, Ohio. A solid night IFR trip. Nothing crazy. Just an RNAV approach into Findlay's runway 25. Everything looked professional. Everything looked routine. And yet, routine turned out to be an illusion. The flight itself started clean. They departed Effingham and climbed smoothly to 7,000 feet IFR cruise. No sign of stress, no anomalies on the radar track. Everything lined up for a by-the-book arrival. Approaching Findlay, they crossed the initial fix, Doyet, and made a 30-degree teardrop entry. Exactly what you'd expect for that approach procedure. They turned outbound, aligned neatly. So far this was textbook instrument flying, but then the track starts to tell a different story. They drifted north of the published hold. Altitude began to wobble, dropping down to 2,600 feet, climbing back to about 3,000 feet, and then, about four nautical miles from the fix, everything collapsed. The airplane snapped into a right-hand descending spiral, dropping out of the sky in seconds. Witnesses on the ground fill in the human perspective. One heard the engine screaming at high RPMs. then an eerie silence. Another saw only the navigation lights cutting down behind the houses, gone in the darkness. The impact tore the Piper apart, scattering fragments through the forest. This wasn't a soft stall or a glide attempt. This was violent, high-energy destruction, and it's important. Nothing in that sequence screams engine failure or structural breakup. It screams something else entirely. When investigators combed through the wreckage, the obvious questions came first. Did the engine quit? Did something snap in the controls? The answers were frustratingly clear. No. The Lycoming power plant showed no signs of pre-impact failure. The control cables, though mangled by impact, were all accounted for. There was no fire, no mid-air explosion, nothing to suggest the airplane itself betrayed them. And here's where it gets really crazy. When the machine checks out, you're left with the human element. Which, let's be honest, is the most uncomfortable part of any accident analysis. But in this case, that's exactly where the investigation had to go. Because two pilots with this much training don't just spiral into the ground for no reason. Something was working against them, and it wasn't the airplane. Here's where the investigation takes a hard turn from frustrating to eye-opening. Toxicology revealed that Shane Halbrook had diphenhydramine in his system. That's Benadryl, an allergy pill most people don't think twice about. He also had doxylamine, the sleep aid sold as Unisom, and traces of dextromethorphan, the cough suppressant in countless cold syrups. Now, let's pause here. 
We're not talking about hardcore narcotics or illicit substances. These are everyday over-the-counter meds, things you and I could pick up at Walgreens right now. That's what makes this so insidious. They hide in plain sight, marketed as harmless, yet the FAA has issued some of its strictest guidance on them. No flying within 60 hours of taking dephenhydramine or doxylamine. Two and a half days. That's longer than the wait time after a night out drinking. Why? Because these drugs don't just make you a little drowsy. They slow cognitive processing, stretch out reaction times, and fog decision making. In simulator studies, pilots on diphenhydramine actually perform worse than those at 0.10% blood alcohol concentration. That's above the legal DUI limit. And that's the crazy part. A pilot who wouldn't dream of drinking before a flight might still pop a Benadryl for hay fever, thinking nothing of it. In Halbrook's case, the meds didn't cause the spiral directly, but they likely sanded down his edge. They made him slower to catch subtle deviations, more likely to misinterpret what his body was telling him, and less equipped to recover once things started slipping away. And remember, this wasn't a calm, clear sky afternoon hop. This was night IMC, hand flying an instrument procedure turn in gusty winds. The workload was already high. The margin for error was already razor thin. Add the meds, and you've got a pilot who's far more vulnerable to what was coming next. Now let's talk about that next link in the chain, spatial disorientation. The NTSB pinned this as the core cause of the crash, and honestly, they're right. If you've ever flown in real IMC, you know how disorienting it can be, even when you're sharp and rested. But let's break it down for those who haven't lived it. Your inner ear works with fluid-filled canals that sense acceleration. They're great for telling you when you're turning or banking, but only for short bursts of movement. If the airplane rolls slowly into a bank, your vestibular system literally stops noticing. It tells you you're straight and level, even though you're not. So the pilot feels fine, but the airplane is quietly carving a turn. Now, here's the cruel twist. If you then try to roll out, based on instruments, the inner ear screams at you that you're banking the other way. The result? You stop trusting your gauges. And in pitch black IMC, where there's no horizon, no moon, no ground lights, nothing but the panel, this illusion is brutally convincing. Look at the radar data from this flight, the slight altitude sag, the wandering course, the eventual tightening spiral. That's the classic graveyard spiral. It's not a sudden catastrophic dive. It's a slow, deceptive drift that ends in a corkscrew toward the ground. And once it accelerates, recovery requires quick recognition and strong corrective inputs. Add Halbrook's slowed reactions from the meds, and you see the trap. He probably didn't even realize the airplane was off until the descent rate exploded. At that point, even with Michael Wright sitting beside him, it may have been too late. And let's be clear, Wright was no slouch. He was an ATP with thousands of hours. But spatial disorientation is physiological, not skill-based. Your inner ear lies to you, no matter how many stripes you've worn on your shoulders. That's the chilling part of this crash. These weren't rookies. They weren't reckless. They were victims of a biological trap that's claimed countless pilots before them, and they had the added weight of impairment nudging them right into it. At this point, it's tempting to shrug and say, bad luck, but here's the real gut punch. This wasn't bad luck. This was a pattern we've seen before, and we'll see again, unless pilots take it seriously. The FAA's own toxicology database shows that diphenhydramine is the number one drug found in fatally injured pilots. Think about that. Not alcohol. Not prescription sedatives. Benadryl. And almost every year we see accidents where the pilot thought, it's just an allergy pill, it won't affect me. That's the real tragedy. It's preventable. And then there's spatial disorientation itself. Night IMC is the perfect storm. No horizon, low ceilings, fatigue, turbulence. The black hole approach has been killing pilots for decades, the NTSB doesn't mince words. Even experienced instrument pilots can get fooled. That's why training emphasizes strict instrument scanning, and why modern cockpits lean so heavily on autopilots. It's not a crutch, it's a safeguard against human physiology. So what's the lesson for the rest of us? 
First, treat medications like alcohol. If the FAA says, wait 60 hours, don't fudge it. Second, respect your limits. No matter your logbook total, you are not immune to illusions. Third, use the tools you have, autopilot, GPS overlays, even just the discipline to say, not tonight, the weather isn't worth it. And here's the sobering reflection. Shane Halbrook and Michael Wright were not careless men. They were professionals who had served their country, flown countless hours, and carried a wealth of knowledge into that cockpit. But in the end, invisible forces, subtle impairments, human biology, and a dark February night tipped the scales against them. The lesson is clear. In aviation, sometimes the smallest unseen risks, an over-the-counter pill, a creeping illusion, can outweigh even the strongest experience. And that's why this story matters. Because the next pilot who takes Benadryl before a flight might not think twice until they're caught in the same spiral.